Okay, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. It doesn't recognize my tablet, so it's okay. I'll just screencast off this thing. Okay, so welcome. Sorry for being late. Uh, this is going to be 635 Communication Systems. I posted these slides online for you to have a look at. Uh, I'll annotate these as I go, so I can post those online as well. But um, anyway, so you have these sets of slides. <coughs> First and foremost, my name. My name is Raymond Fan. You can call me Ray, or you don't have to call me Dr. Fan. I think that's really, you know, it makes me feel bigger than I really am. Just a normal guy, just like you guys. So just call me Ray. It's fine. Uh, counseling hours. I uh, I'm here right before lecture between five and six on Wednesday and Wednesdays. I'm not here this week. It doesn't make any sense to have counseling hours because we haven't covered enough theory yet. But uh, I will have counseling hours starting next week, uh, five to six before uh, each class. All right. So my office is in ENG 428. If you need to shoot me off with an email, go ahead. It's uh, rfanrc.ca. I'm uh, usually on my phone on, you know, almost all the time, uh, unless I'm sleeping, of course. But uh, I, sh I should be able to reply to your email uh, within half an hour or so. Uh, I got some emails uh, yesterday regarding lab exemptions. I haven't got to that yet because I've been really busy, but I will get to you eventually. Uh, you have two TAs this semester. You have uh, Noor, which is uh, Mondays in Section 1, and your Puya, who's doing the other two sections, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday for 3 and 2, respectively. Uh, here's the breakdown, how it's going to go. Um, I hope none of you showed up to labs this week because there are none. If you did, then I'm really sorry that you did, but unfortunately you wasted your time. But there are no labs this week. All right, so how it's going to go, uh, there are classes Monday and Wednesday from 6 to 9, uh, you, know, every, you know, each week until the end of the term, which is about the end of June. And then labs are about three hours on select weeks. So um, you don't show up to labs uh, every week. There are certain times when you show up and when you don't show up. I made uh, there, I made some uh, weeks where you have no labs in order to catch up on the theory so you can actually know enough to actually do the actual lab portions. Okay, so um, consult the uh, course schedule for more details. But specifically, if you're in section one, which is on Monday, you go from weeks three, five, six, and seven. So Labs actually start the next week, but because of the uh, holiday on the Monday, there are actually no labs. So you guys actually start a week later. But then the guys who have labs on Tuesday and Wednesday, they go first. So the, the schedule is a little unorthodox. I'll let you consult the course schedule for more details. And uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, I usually like to record videos in real time. So some people like to learn on their own time. Some people like to come to class. I try to accommodate for everyone who wants to come to class or wants to learn on their own time. So if uh, you fall asleep during some portions or if you miss class or you just want to you know, get drunk and go to the bar and not come to class, I'm totally fine with that. You can uh, watch uh, videos online. So I'm actually screencasting this uh, in real time. So all you have to do is just you can go to the YouTube playlist that I have here. I'll also post the uh, raw MPEG-4 videos and also direct YouTube links to each video that I have on the uh, D12 course uh, after each lecture. Okay, so more and more on this stuff later, but I am recording in real time here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so how it's going to work, uh, same, uh, you know, if you've taken this course before in the past, it's the same breakdown as before. The lab portions are worth only 30%, so you have 25% um, uh, experiments, so each experiment is 6 and a quarter percent, and then you have a formal lab report uh, at the end. So basically how it works is the TAs will randomly get you to do one of the labs as a formal lab report. Uh, the guidelines and all that are on the actual d course website for you to take a look at how you actually structure the formal lab. It's, uh, you, can, um, you can figure that out on your own. Okay, so um, here's another thing. Uh, if you've taken this course before and uh, you don't want to do the labs again, I'm totally fine with that. Just uh, shoot me up with an email and say, hey, I'd like to be exempt. And make sure you send me a snapshot of all of your lab grades so I can... Take those, and those will be your lab grades for this semester. So you don't have to show up to any of the labs if you're exempt. All you're responsible for is the theory component. Okay, so you don't have to show up to any labs if you're exempt. You can go ahead and just show up to the midterm and exam by itself. If you want to redo the labs, if you didn't do as well as you did last semester, then okay, sure, you can go ahead and redo them. I don't mind. But if you want to clearly be exempt, then just send me an email with a snapshot of your lab grades saying, hey, I'd like to be exempt, and show me what they are, and then I will apply those lab grades to this semester. So all you're responsible for is the theory. Okay? Uh, the midterm exam will be in class uh, Monday, June 13th from 6, 10 to 8. So it's just going to be a couple of hours. And then there's nothing that's going to happen after that point. So it's just the midterm and that's it. You're done. Okay? All right. So this is how the course schedule is going to work. It's a little bit unorthodox, but uh, it's you're basically taking a 13-week course and condensing it to a six and a half-week course. So it's a little, it's going to be a little rushed, unfortunately, but it should be nothing we can't handle. 
All right. So this week is purely going to be introduction and review. So you know, stuff about what a communication system is, just very brief, brief overview of what you're going to cover in this course. And then we're going to do a signals and systems review for the rest of the week. So just make sure that we all know exactly what we're doing before we actually get onto the meat of the course, which is actually communication systems. Uh, Monday, May 23rd is a holiday, so there's no class, there's no lab. So obviously, you know, make sure you don't show up. And then uh, starting the next week, if you're in sections two and three, that's when you start your first lab. And then the week after, the guys who miss the lab on the, the next Monday will go Monday after that. And then there's a pause. There's no lab for uh, Wednesday and Monday for June 6th. And then you will start the next experiment once we cover enough um, you know, amplitude modulation. That's a, you know, that's a concept we're going to cover later in this course. And then uh, there will be a brief pause for no lab for the guys on Wednesday. And then you guys will be in sync for uh, the, the last two labs. Okay. So, it's, uh, so this course schedule is pretty straightforward. You see the midterm exam there. And uh, I try to space it out as much as, uh, as, much as possible. If there's time at the end, I'll try to make a final exam review, but uh, you know, this course is quite fast paced, so I'll, I'll try to accommodate for everybody. Okay, so the course reference text, you don't have to buy it, it's completely optional. You are totally fine to use the slides and the notes that I have as material that you'll study for the midterm and the final exam. But if you want to purchase it, then certainly you can. But you might, if you're <coughs> planning on taking communications in the fourth year, then by all means, please do buy it. Yeah, there's a lot of Good content in there for you to, to consult if you tend to if you want to go into a career in communications later, but uh, I, I would recommend you buy it if you're going to the fourth year. But if this is probably the, you know, the last time you're going to see communications, then don't worry about buying it. Okay, uh, you can take a look at the textbook. There are also course notes by Dr. Zaitanoglu from last year that uh, are pretty much a good uh, companion, if you will, with the actual course text. So you're more than welcome to take a look at that if you want. Uh, the most of the material that I'll be presenting will be using his slides with some modifications on my end. And for the last part of the course, I'll be using uh, slides from one of my colleagues, uh, Lamia Khalid, who, who's generous enough to, lend, to let me use her slides for the last part of the course. OK, so just logistics in terms of how this course is going to be run. Please visit the course website often. There's going to be a bunch of updates after each class, specifically you know, posting uh, videos, uh, annotated lecture notes, if I make any notes on the actual slides themselves. Uh, the actual YouTube links and the MPEG-4 files for each video capture that I do after class, I'll, I'll put them, I'll put them you know, online. And then there are also assignment and review questions. They are completely optional. You can do them on your own time. There are also solutions posted if you wish, if you want to take a look at those. Uh, they're basically there to help you understand the material. But I'll also be doing questions in class just to make sure you know what you're doing. But there are, there are also questions on the actual D2L website if you want to um, do those on your own time and reinforce your learning for the concepts. Okay, uh, if you intend to do the lab labs this year, uh, those lab documents are posted online already. They're under a lab section in the D2L website. You can go ahead and take a look at them uh, if you wish. Uh, we don't start till next week, but you can certainly go ahead and take a look at them now. Uh, there are pre labs to complete, which means that you have to do a little bit of work, some some theoretical work before you um, go into the actual lab, and the TA will check them off and just make sure you understand the material. You do the actual lab sessions in the actual you know classroom. And then there are post labs, just very brief uh, discussion questions that you answer just to make sure that you understand what's going on in the lab. Okay? And then if you are chosen to do a formal report for that particular lab, you have to do it within, specific, you know, within a specified timeline that the TA will give you. This is going to be more information on that website. Uh, other information, such as you know, the course outline, uh, you know, links to communication systems, and also a bunch of different past exams and solutions. Uh, if you want to understand the material a little bit more, uh, you can check them out on D2L, of course. Okay, so uh, just some. This is basically how it's going to go down in terms of what's going to be covered in the course. So this first week is just introduction, uh, making sure you know all your ELE 532 stuff before we go into the actual meat of the course. Making sure everyone knows exactly what you know, what we're going to get into, and then uh, the meat of this course is learning about what's known as amplitude modulation and angle or frequency modulation. Those are two different techniques to transmit information over communication systems, and then we're going to take a look at a brief about introduction or overview of uh, probability and random processes. Unfortunately, you're going to have to know that for the last part of the course. And then we'll take a look at uh, the effects of noise in communication systems. So that's very important if you want to uh, take a look at performance analysis and making sure that your system is feasible when you take a look at noise. So the lecture format is going to go like this. Uh, the first two hours are going to be theory. We're going to cover pretty much uh, the theoretical concepts in the course. 
I'll take a 10 minute break in between. So from 6.10 to 7 is theory, take a 10 minute break. And then 7.10 to 8 o'clock theory, take another break. And then finally, the last part of the uh, hour or last part of the actual class will be a tutorial. So it will basically just be me um, solving questions, um, you know, from the tutorials and from the past exams and stuff. So um, I'm not, I don't think I'll be able to cover enough theory for you to do a tutorial this time. So I'm going to do it. I'll, I'll defer it to Wednesday. Then I forgot my uh, tablet pen, so I kind of screwed up there. So we'll, we'll defer the tutorial till Wednesday, and then I'll let you guys go a little early today. All right? So there are four different lab experiments you're going to take along that. The first experiment is just ELE 532 review. So taking a look at spectrum, you know, the frequency, frequency domain Fourier transforms, taking a look at it in terms of the spectrum analyzer. And then you'll take a look at uh, amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and then the last project, which is pretty cool, you're going to combine both of those concepts to create uh, a real-time like uh, radio receivers. You can actually receive radio signals and actually listen to what uh, radio stations are transmitting, which is called software-defined radio. Okay, so last but not least, before we get into some introductory material, you know, this course is mandatory, right? They're basically forcing you to take this course. So why, why exactly are we studying communications? Why is this course important? Uh, well, without it, you probably wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things that you're comfortable in doing. Sending text messages, sending text messages, you know, following tweets, using the internet, using your cell phone, talking on your mobile phone. I'm oh, sorry, that's actually the same thing. Talking on an actual, you know, analog phone. So these are built on communication systems and without those, you know, without the actual theory behind communication systems, everything that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis would basically be not available to you. I and mean, pretty much be back in the Stone Ages where you'd have to use like pen and paper and you know send it through snail mail and those technologies would not be possible without communication systems. Okay, so in this course we're gonna specifically talk about how we transmit information and receive that transmitted information from whoever sent it to you. Okay, so we're gonna study the following topics. So we're gonna take a look at uh, analyzing communication systems in detail, uh, the mathematical tools behind it using Fourier transform and integrals and derivatives and all that. And we'll take a look at how to actually transmit communication, um, you, know, s you know, signals through communication systems. So taking a look at different channels and how exactly you can facil facilitate that transmitting. Uh, we'll take a look at basic receiving and transmitting techniques. So the, the process of transmitting a signal and receiving that signal from the transmitting again in order to see what the heck the person sent. Uh, taking a look at, uh, you know, noise analysis and performance analysis and communication systems. And finally, how to implement these things in practice. Okay. So... If you want to walk away from this class today, uh, if you just want to remember one thing about what I talked about, the whole point of communication systems is to take some sort of message, whether it's an image or if it's a text message or something that you want to convey to somebody, you want to transmit that to someone, some destination, whether it's a mobile phone or, or someone who's waiting for your actual message. You want to transmit that message over to them in as you know, in a quick and efficient manner, and you want it to make sure that what they receive is identical or closely similar to what you intended to send them. So the point is to send something to some user, they get it, and you want to make sure that they actually get what you've actually sent. Okay, so that's basically the objective in the end. All right? Okay, so uh, this is basically a generic communication system. We're going to go right on to the actual introduction of this course. So this is a block diagram of what a communication system looks like. So you have something which is called an input message. Right? What an input message is, is it's something that you want to send to the user, whether it's an image, if it's a text, or something something that you want to convey to the actual person that wants to receive that particular signal. Okay, So it's a signal that contains raw information. It could be human voice, it could be an image, it could be video, or something that you want to convey to the person at the, at the, other, end, at the other side. Okay. So the very first thing that you have to do is you have to take this raw information, you have to convert it into an electrical signal. Yep, it's called an input transducer. So if you've taken, uh, there's a sensors and transducers course in third year, this is basically what you'd study. You take that raw information, if it's voice or if it's an image or it's a video, and you have to convert it into some sort of compatible format that the electronics and the communication system will be able to understand. So you want to convert it into some sort of electrical signal, if it's a voltage or current or whatever is compatible for that particular system that you're trying to transmit it to. Uh, we'll also refer to the input signal as a baseband signal, an input or message signal. So all three of those things are synonymous with each other. So they all mean exactly the same thing. It's either a message signal, a baseband signal, or, or an input signal. All right. So once you create, once you convert that actual raw content into an electrical signal, the point now is to take that electrical signal and you want to transmit it. You want to be able to um, 
you want to be able to format it in such a way where it will convert it. So, uh, it, so you have this preliminary stage where you want to convert your raw, you know, your raw signal into a voltage signal. All right. So what the transmitter does is that it transforms it in such a way where it will be compatible to the medium that it's going to be sent to, which is actually called a channel. But um, the tr the point of the transmitter is to, you know, is to transform that actual input signal so that it best matches the medium or where it'll best suit the actual method of transformation that or the transmission that it's going to go through. Okay, so it converts the input signal so that it best matches what's known as the channel characteristics. We'll get into that later, and it uses something which is called modulation and frequency translation techniques, which I'll get, which I'll get into much later. But the point is that it transforms it so that where, however, it's going to transmit over. So you can think of a channel as the actual medium that the signal is going to transfer over. So you can think of a channel as, for example, if you're using Wi-Fi, the channel will be the air. Or if you're using, uh, if you're doing uh, communication networks, the Ethernet cable will be will be actual channel. So it's the actual medium that is actually being used to transmit information from one point to another. And the job of the transmitter is to transform the actual input signal so that it best matches the characteristics of the actual medium that you want to transmit the signal over to. Okay. So that's pretty much what the channel is. So it's the actual medium that you want to send the actual signals over to, right? And then so you have the channel, and then so we've actually just talked about the first part of it so far. So you you know, you take your transducer, you transform it into uh, an electrical signal, and then you use the transmitter to get it ready so that you can transmit it over to some channel that you want. And then you have to consider the receiving end. So you've transmitted the signal, like, you know, it's propagating, it's propagating. And then you have to have some sort of receiver that's going to receive the signal and figure out what you actually sent. And that's what, you, what, that's what the actual receiver does, right? But before we get into that, you know, not all channels are what are known as ideal. There might be some sort of distortion or noise that will try to, you know, play around with your signal or corrupt your signal so that the output after the distortion or the noise will not look exactly like the input signal that you sent in. And that's not, that's not good. Right? So you want to be able to design the electronics or to design the system in such a way that it'll, it'll reduce noise or it try to, tries to ignore noise as best as possible. So in the actual channel, you know, ideally, you know, whatever you put in, it, whatever you get out, it should match. But usually inside the channel there's a lot of noise, uh, so bad things can happen like distortion, noise, interference, even fading, you know, where the signal, the amplitude actually decreases over time. So you want to be able to design your electronics in such a way that at the receiving end, it'll best match what you try to send into the actual communication system as best as possible. Okay, so then you have the output transducer, which will because at the receiver end, you when you when you finally you know um, get the receiving end, you still have that electrical signal. What you want to do is you want to undo what the transmitter did, right? Because the output of that channel will be that transform input that was you know that you did so that it suited transmission inside the channel. So what the output transducer does is that it will reverse all the modifications that you did. So you converted you know, the raw signal to electrical signal, you did the transmission, and then this end is the opposite effect. So it undoes whatever the transmitter did, and then the output transducer converts the electrical signal back into the actual raw image text or whatever video you sent at the receiving end so you can actually um, see what the, per what the person sent. And that's what the output message is. Okay, so I pretty much reiterated this objective, of course. So you're basically, you want to transmit information within the input signal to the receiving end such that whatever you get at the receiving end, it matches or it closely matches whatever you sent from the input signal at the, at the beginning of the actual transmission as best as possible. You want to do it efficiently, uh, cheaply, or economically, and you want to do it as effectively as possible. Okay? And, all right, let's see. Okay, good. So in this course, we're going to study uh, analog communication systems. Okay, so what I mean by analog is that your signals are in continuous time. So they, they're, they're, they're a voltage, you know, they're a time-varying signal that uh, varies from, you know, with amplitude and it varies over time. The uh, fourth year course, uh, ELE 745, that you'll see in the uh, fourth semester, the very first, no, the uh, fourth year, the very first semester, but we'll concentrate on digital communication systems. Okay, so there's analog and then there's digital where your amplitude is um, a bunch of binary bits. Not amplitude, but your signal is a bunch of binary bits. So why do we need to study analog communication systems when the majority of what you're dealing with right now is all digital? Like your cell phone, your text messages, all the images are basically, they're, they, all, they all transmitted through digital communication systems. So why do you need to study analog? What's the point of doing analog before digital? 
Well, the reason why you use digital communication systems is because they also use analog signals to transmit their information over the channel. Okay? So if you wanted to transmit binary bits, you would, you would actually use a voltage where it varies from like plus 5 to minus 5. That'll reflect you know, 0 and 1. So you use analog signals to actually transfer uh, your digital information over the actual channel. So if you want to study digital communication systems, you have to know the analog first well enough. And then once you figure that out, then you can go ahead and actually study digital communication systems. All right, so this course will be a fundamental building block to get to that part of the stage, uh, to that stage if you want to pursue a career in this kind of material. Okay, so what I mean specifically is, okay, so let's say, you know, this is analog, trans you know, analog transition. So let's say we've got some, you know, uh, you know, message, message signal, input signal, and we've converted it into a voltage. And that's what the left, you know, side would be, okay? And then in an ideal channel, what you do is you want to send the signal through the ideal channel, and the output should pretty much equal uh, what the actual input message that you sent, all right? So that's what it should be. But then uh, in practice, what may happen is that the actual channel that you have, it may be corrupted with a bunch of noise and a bunch of unwanted you know, effects that you probably don't want in your actual input signal. So what you may get at the actual end is something like this. All right. So this is the input signal that you send that's been converted to an electrical signal or whatever. You send it over your channel, and then this is what you get at the receiving end. It doesn't really look nice. And a lot of the modifications that you've made on the actual signal, you can't, you don't really know what the original signal was because that, that's the noise is pretty, it's messed up a lot of things. Okay. So specifically, let's say at this particular point in time, you see that the amplitude is five volts, and then you push it through the actual channel, and then what you see at the receiving end is roughly 5.03 volts. And the reason why that is is because the channel has a lot of noise and and uh, and a lot of things that you don't want, you know the actual signal to act on. And then what you get at the output is not really what you, what you see for the input. So what you want to do is you want to design a system in such a way where the output should approximately equal the input or you know there, there should you should be able to recover what the original person sent. Okay? So specifically, uh, from this absurd time point, there's no way you could figure out how exactly you can go back to five because the actual noise itself, the distribution of the noise, you actually don't know. It's a random signal, right? So you can't, you actually don't know exactly what parts of the signal were corrupted because it's all random. Okay? So the reason why you want to use digital transmission is because it's very robust against noise. So for example, let's say you wanted to transmit five volts using a digital communication system. So what you do is you take these, you take the five volts and you encode it into its binary representation. So if you represent five as you know base ten, or you want to you want to represent five volts, you can change that so that it represents the sequence of binary. So one zero one is actually you know five in binary. Okay, and then what you can do is you can change it so that each bit outputs a particular voltage. So in this case, you want to choose zero as being negative A or whatever it could be. It could be uh, 10 or 5 volts or whatever the communication system you're using has for that particular amplitude. So we'll let zero be negative A and one be positive A. So in this case, uh, if you want to transmit five, you transmit four pulses that fluctuate from minus A to plus A. So zero is minus A and plus A would be one. Okay, so you transmit this signal over time. So that those four <coughs> voltage pulses would be the actual point in time that you want to transmit. Okay, So this is the actual signal that we have, and let's say we push it through our channel, and uh, let's see here, oh sorry, let's, I should have had some, okay there was supposed to be a diagram here, but uh, basically what's happening here is that, I'll show this later, but what will happen is that if you were to, um, you know, push this through a channel, what will happen is that this noise here, will, you know, this noise, the channel will actually corrupt the actual signal itself, so you'll see a bunch of like noise stuff here. But you can you get the general gist of what the shape of the actual curve would be. So even though um, you know there's a bunch of noise that affects your signal, with the digital communication system, you're only expecting one of two possible values. So when you have noise that corrupts the signal, as long as you know the noise kind of fluctuates around the amplitude that you're looking at, you can reconstruct the signal and you can get the actual original value back. So with a digital communication system, it's actually a lot more robust than noise in comparison to an analog system. All right? Okay. So the main advantage of a digital communication system is that you are sending the symbolic representation of that value. 
Okay, so even if you have a channel with a lot of noise, it's very possible to get the original signal that you see at the output from the input signal that you send it. Okay, so this is only possible if your signal consists of a finite set of possible numbers. So, for example, if you wanted to, if you're, you know, in this in this case with the previous slides here, you know, you've got four bits. So that means there are 16 possible values you can send. So as long as you have a signal which only has 16 possible numbers that you want to convey, then it's very possible that you can have a system that will be able to reconstruct your input signal as best as possible. Okay, so this is what is known as MA recoding, where M is the total number of levels that you're looking at. So um, an example, so for example, if you have, to, if you're taking a look at this system here, it's what's known as 16 A recoding because you have 16 possible levels. So M is just the number of you know, bits or number of possible bit, you know, possible representations of that voltage that you're looking at. Okay, and this is my uh, last slide, and then we'll take a break. You know, I, I want to be able to split it so that the um, the introduction is one video, and then we'll cover the theory for the for the next video after. So. We're going to take a look at one more example. We're comparing between analog and uh, digital communication systems. So back then, probably in the early 90s or so, when you wanted to send faxes to people, you can send faxes now, but it's actually uh, there are services online for you to do that. You just upload your image, and then they send they actually send they actually send a fax for you. But if you've ever used a fax machine, uh, what you do here is you have uh, some sort of input image that you want to send. So usually, what happens is that uh, you scan an image and then the actual image is digitized and that information gets sent over communication networks to the receiving end with the fax, you know, with the, with the receiving fax machine that actually reprints what image you actually tried to send over the communication set channel. So you've got a fax machine, you use, uh, you know, using a, a telephone channel which is mostly noisy and then you have another fax machine that tries to receive this message at the end. So uh, this is what the input would look like, and then this is what the output would possibly look like if you were to transmit it over a noisy channel. Okay. So as an analog image, like if you wanted to do it completely with analog, if you wanted to represent this as an analog signal, uh, you would get this image as a result, and it's actually quite noisy. Okay. So, however, if you decide to transmit this, where you're using uh, in terms of like if you're taking a look at digital communications. Uh, what you can still see here is that the actual, you know, letters themselves are they're still quite visible, right? So if you were to send this over by a digital communication system instead, you can pretty much ignore that noise, and then you can take a look at the actual image and say, hey, well, there's an A and there's a B and there's a C there because you can because you're only expecting a certain number of levels. In this case, there's only two possible levels, zero and one, right? So as long as each, you know, signal is roughly within the vicinity of zero or one, then you can just consider that as either being zero or one. So if you can completely ignore the noise, and then you would be able to reconstruct the image as best as possible if you took a look at a digital communication system. Okay, and that's all I have here. So we'll take a break, uh, about five or ten minutes. I have to go get course outlines because I was late, so I'm going to go get those now. I'll come back and I'll hand you out official course outlines, and those will be the only handouts I give you this semester, other than your midterm and final exam. So there's this course is paper free. Okay, thank you very much.